Cigar here with part two of my episode with Dean Thomas, where he joins me this evening tonight from Fort Lauderdale. Where are you at now? I'm in West Palm Palm Beach. Okay, West Palm Palm Beach. So a big welcome back. Dean, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me again. Tell us about the radio show you co-host. Oh, wow. I'm on uh, Josh Cohen and the home team. It's a ESPN West Palm 106.3 in West Palm Beach. If you're in the West Palm Beach area, we're on from 12. Or I'm sorry, from 10 to 12 every day. I'm on from on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But Josh Coleman is on from uh, every day of the week, Monday through Friday. And it is a show that's uh, it's all about sports. It's about life. We we make fun of each other. We have a good time, and I think it's an enjoyable show for anybody to listen to. I also see you had some dance moves recently that you put up on Twitter with the fro thing going on. What's that all about? <laughs> uh, I, I'm a I'm a goofball, you know. I do I do a lot of things in entertainment. Uh, I do improv comedy, so any opportunity I get to entertain people, I'm going to do it. You can laugh. You can always have a yeah. good laugh at my expense. We can. We can. And speaking of um, improv, your co-host Josh Cohen had some questions to ask you, so he sent them Ooh. in, and let's get ready to go with those. Josh wants to know, where does your passion for live comedy theater performance come from? <laughs> wow, this is that's a deep question, actually. Uh, honestly, I think it comes from uh, the fact that I needed to express myself. And as a fighter, I was expressing myself in a certain way, which was a little bit maybe construed as violent. Mm, uh, interesting. Since I, re- yeah, since I retired, I needed to express myself and in a different way and i am no longer have any violent tendencies in me we're currently accepting donations to help build a theater so that we can teach people about the performance arts improvisation and all the different uses the phone is blowing up man i'm telling you this chick it will not stop hey uh i'm i'm almost finished i promise you i'm going to be done in a second as soon as i'm finished you can carry on about your conversation i promise all right, I'm going to start over. All right. Hi, I'm Dean Thomas, former UFC fighter, current coach to many of the top fighters in the world today. But I want to talk to you about something very special to me. And that's the... Like, Will you shut the up? Me, I have the, no, no longer that dark place in me. I'm full of light now. So I think I'm just... I'm, I'm silly and I'm really goofy and I need to express myself. So I think that... Um, it's just an extension of the way I used to fight, except for on the opposite end. And now I'm just, I just like to entertain people. Well, you do a good job at that. I must compliment you. Thank you so much. Josh also wants me to ask you, what was the exact moment you knew your fighting career was over? <sighs> and this is, a, this is deep because a lot of fighters need to pay attention to the signs. And... You know, there were moments in my career where I felt like it was over, but I kept, I stayed with it and I I stuck with it. But uh, when I lost to Georgie Karakanyan, that was when I really, truly knew it was over. You know, after losing that fight, I was, I remember being in the third round of that fight, just thinking like, wow, this is fun, but I don't necessarily want to win. And anytime you no longer want to win, it's over. You know, it's too bad because I see some of the newer fans coming up in MMA and some of the older fighters are losing. And it it breaks my heart because I feel like the fan doesn't get a chance to know what they've accomplished beforehand. I just, I want them to win so badly so they can go out on a, on an up note, but then they don't. And I say, oh, maybe they should retire. Maybe they should. It's, it's a crossroads, I think, for many fighter to be able to go deep inside himself and figure out when it is time to end his career or her career. Yeah, fighters have to do a lot of soul searching because I think fi- mo- more than not, fighters retire too late and they let the game retire them. And that's one thing that I never allowed myself to do. I never I never wanted the game to retire me. I wanted to be able to retire from the game and I achieved that. And I can say I successfully achieved that and I'm proud of myself for being able to do that. And the final question from Josh comes from him. He wants to know, can you talk about the exact moment you lost your son's trust forever? <laughs> oh, wow. I don't know if I should be telling the story. So, okay. All right. Do you not want to do it? No, no. I can tell the story. No, I, I'm for sure. So we were we were at uh, BJ's, which is a, um, a, 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 sh- a grocery store. Well, a big store which sells in bulk. And we were at the bakery section and he wanted a cookie. He was about <laughs> six years old. He's 12 now. So he was about six years old. 
and he wanted a cookie and he's extremely shy and i get this he's 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 shy wow. so i said okay i said you can have a cookie but you have to ask the lady behind the counter because you know they give the cookies to the kids so he said okay and and i was so proud of him for this moment that he wanted to go ask the lady for the cookie so he walks up as quiet as a mouse and he asked the lady for a cookie he said can i have a cookie and i was so <laughs> proud of him and the lady behind the counter looked at me and she said can he have a cookie and i looked at him and i said boy are you crazy you ain't having no dog on cookie <laughs> and ever no! since he, yeah and and from that moment on he never had my trust again <laughs> He probably had nightmares. You became like the cookie monster or something. Yeah, right? I know. well, you know, I get, I let him have the cookie. I I eventually let him have the cookie, but I thought it was a good moment to roast my kid. And ever since, me, he's been roasting me back ever since. So. Oh, he's it's only twelve. He's only twelve years old, wow. but he's ex- but he's extremely mature. Well, I very that, mature. Man. Very Coming mature. from you, well, I know that to be true. Yeah, he's a very mature twelve. Big issue: weight cutting. Seems like some of the UFC athletes and some of the Bellator people are having a real hard time with that, and I hate to see them struggle with it. Can you share with us what is the worst weight cut you have been a part of? Oh wow, um, I, I've been a part of so, me personally, or with another per, watching another person yeah, do watching, it. Yeah, watching either one, whichever one's the worst. Well, share the worst well, story. Yeah, I'd have to say one of the worst stories I, I remember was in in Japan actually with a, a fighter by the name of Marcus Aurelio, and I remember him. Yeah, he was fighting Mishima, a fighter named Mishima, and I remember him in Pride, and I remember him making the weight, and but I, for some reason they didn't record it right or something happened, it, it wasn't right, and he he had to eat, so he went and ate because he thought he made the weight, and later that night at two o'clock in the morning. The Japanese commission comes to his room and says, "Hey, you got to make the weight again." Now, yeah. Wow. Now, granted, like with and that it, hours have elapsed. So we're talking about six, seven hours had passed since the weigh-in. So he's back out on the street at three o'clock in the morning, oh trying gosh. to cut all the weight that he put back on, and he and he had to make the weight again after putting on, you know, ten, twelve pounds wow, that's in that crazy. time. So yeah, and it, it, and I just remember him just struggling to make that weight, struggling to make it. And it was uh, pretty sad to see. You've been a part of the sport for so long. In your opinion, what does it take to make a champion? Well, you know, there there are a lot of factors involved. You know, and right now I, I coach two of them, Amanda Nunez and Tyron Woodley. And there's something about their personalities that allow them to be the champion. One is that one thing is that they're and this is i don't want to make this sound bad but they're a bit selfish yeah but that's what it takes because you have to put yourself ahead of everybody else if you want to get what you want very similar to the idea that on a plane you know if the plane is going down you got to put the mask on your face first before you put it on your kid so that's the mentality that they have is that i'm going to get mine first but i'm going to send it to you afterwards so one thing is that you have to be you have to be willing to be a bit selfish. But you have to justify that selfishness, though, because you have to be good. Yeah. So another yeah. thing is that they're very honest with themselves about their skill sets. They know exactly what they're good at. And they know what they're bad at. So, And then they have tre- tremendous work ethic. So yeah. those, those are the three things. You have to be a bit selfish. You have to be honest with yourself. And you have to have tremendous work ethic. All right, good advice. Switching gears a little bit. When did you? When do you find the time to golf? <laughs> like hello. <laughs> I go. I go. Like, well, I've been taking golf lessons once a week, and uh, you know I'm terrible at it. It's it's a very frustrating and difficult sport to learn. I mean, it just you know it looks so easy on TV. You know, yeah. uh, just being able to hit this little ball with this club with I don't know. It it just seems so easy, but it's so difficult. So yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not very. Okay. It's a difficult sport. My uh, dad had attempted to try and get me to learn it, but I just don't have the time to spend. And you know what? I'm not getting up at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the morning on Saturday to go golf, especially not if there's a fight on. So that, that just totally eradicated everything for me. Who are your heroes? Wow. You know, it, it really depends on, you know, what I'm doing. I have a lot of different people that I look up to. And throughout my and, – and it all kind of – transcends you know the different uh areas in which i try to express myself when you know when i was coming up as a fighter i used to look at like a lot of basketball players as heroes like 
yeah, like Allen Iverson and Kobe Bryant. Like those were two of my favorite. Um, some boxers as far as uh, uh, Bernard Hopkins um, and, and Eric Morales. Uh, but now that I'm doing a lot of comedy and, and acting, you know, I look up to obviously, you know, Denzel Washington and yeah. Johnny Depp and, uh, you know, just tremendous actors. So, I mean, I have just a lot of different heroes and people that I look up to. What stands out to you, do you think, is the greatest MMA fight of all time? <sighs> You can pick it's two if you're say. struggling. Okay, no, no, it, it's hard to say. <laughs> but for me, I'm such an old school guy. I'm really an old school guy, and and I I'll, I'll say, you know, the first the first fight between, you know, Carl Uno and Ru Asado is my favorite fight of all time, and that's a fight that you know, even though, maybe if I look back at it today, it might not be as good as it was when I, you know, when I was coming up. But for me, that's my favorite fight of all time. All right, I got a big surprise for you, Dean. Uh, I hope it's shiny. It's not shiny. It could be shiny, though. Mr. Luke Bernard sent us a clip from the feature film that you and T. Woodley are in called The Favorite. Come on, defend that. It's your time, man. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, yes, sir. Whoa. 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 The winner by knockout in the second round. Benjamin, the favorite, Bernard. Yeah, you know, I honestly kind of played myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, um, I, I played a, a coach to a fighter who was played by Alex Nicholson. Oh, yeah? Well, and, but the funny thing about that is that I was actually Alex Nicholson's very first MMA coach. Oh, so wow. essentially, I really kind of played myself. Uh, it, was, it was a really good opportunity. Um, I wish the film all the success in the world. I'm hoping that it does well. Um, you know, I, I'm, I really do. I hope it does well. Tyron, I, I remember when Tyron was uh, preparing for the role. You know, we were at Duke Rufus's in Milwaukee, and he was preparing for the role, and he was, you know, working on his accent and his voice and his and his little mannerisms as his character. And the next thing I know, he was like, "Hey, I got you a part in the movie," and I was like, "Really?" Because I was <laughs> at first, I was just helping him. I wasn't in the movie, but I was just helping him prepare for the role, and he got me actually got me a role in the movie. So um, I'm That's grateful. Pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I want to let our viewers know that we don't have a release yet date for the movie but you can follow it at thefavoritemovie.com and on facebook twitter and instagram at the favorite mov dean what is the one thing my viewers would be surprised to learn about you that i'm an introvert yeah i'm surprised. i mean yeah, I'm, I'm really shy actually i'm really shy and i'm an introvert and it, it, as much as i'm on stage and constantly in front of people and doing my thing I'm re I really like to be alone all the time. Yeah, I really, I'm really like more often than not, I just want to be alone. Uh oh, I resemble that remark. <laughs> <laughs> all right, coaching, traveling, golfing, you know, working on movies, taping with Dana White and Matt Sarah. When do you sleep? It's hard. It's tough. I mean, I. I I operate on a 24-hour schedule where it's like two in the morning is the same as two in the afternoon yeah, to me. Yeah. So like I can be sleep, I can be taking a nap at from two to four and then be up all night, or be sleep from two to four at night and then be up. So it's just you know time doesn't matter to me. I just I, I need to get stuff done. I get stuff done, and I just I move. I make things happen. You are a mover and a shaker. And before we go, to anything else you want to add, Dean? No, I, again, you know, I just, you know, I appreciate you having me on. This is this is a, an honor for me to come on to your show. Aww, that's nice. Before we go today, I want to remind our viewers that you can subscribe to me on YouTube at the link below, and you can reach me at Susan Singari MMA, and you can also follow Din on Twitter.com at Din Thomas, Facebook at Leonardo Da Vinci, and Instagram at Din Thomas. But pronounced Dean Thomas. Dean, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. 